Can you hear me in the back? Yes? So, I, thank you. I've been in, encouraged, and I, I will personally encourage people to ask. I'm going to use chalk, and I want people to ask me questions. If you don't ask me questions, I will you know, I throw chalk at you or something, something like that. So, okay. I've written my name on the, on the chalkboard over, over there, not just because I like to see my name in lights, but because um, on my website, if you Google Steve Simon Oxford Physics, you'll find my website. And somewhere on my website, there's a link that says homework for summer school. And you can click on that, and you can find all the homework assignments which I'm going to assign to you. You don't have to do them, but, but they're fun problems, and you learn something from doing them. So I'm encouraging people to try to work through some of these, these things that I will assign to you as, as summer school problems. And they're all written out nicely with all the details in them on, that, uh, on the website. Um, so in this lecture, I'm going to talk about integer quantum Hall effect. And we heard a little bit about that from Charlie uh, earlier. It's one of the simplest, if not the simplest, case of, of topological insulator in two dimensions. Um, and in the next lecture, I'll talk about uh, fractional quantum Hall effect. So integer quantum Hall effect is sort of a prerequisite to, to fractional quantum Hall effect. But before we even get to integer quantum Hall effect, we have to go all the way back uh, 150 years to 1879 where we have the classical Hall effect that probably everyone has heard about somewhere in their life before, but I'm going to remind you what it is. So this is the experiment done by Edwin Hall, 1879 at Johns Hopkins uh, University. He had a block of metal. He applied a magnetic field to the block of metal. He ran a current through the block of metal like this, and then he can measure two voltages. There is a longitudinal voltage, V, sub L, like this, in the same direction as the current. And then there is a Hall voltage, which is now called, well, it's now called Hall voltage, after Edwin Hall, in the direction perpendicular to the, to the current. And what Edwin Hall measured is, looks kind of like this, the magnetic field. I, for many people will have seen this before. I, I was told to start from the very beginning, so, so I will. If you need to fall asleep for a while, please feel free to do so. I'll wake you up when I say something you haven't heard before. OK, so you can measure the, these voltages as a function of magnetic field. And what Edwin Hall measured in 1879 was the longitudinal voltage is roughly independent of magnetic field, whereas the Hall voltage is roughly linear in magnetic field. And we understand now, through basically through Druda theory, which is just uh, um, classical kinematics of, of electrons running around in the solid. The reason for the Hall voltage being linear and magnetic field is that there's a Lorentz force on moving charged particles. The Lorentz force makes the particles curve to one side of the sample. It builds up a, a Hall voltage. And that's what you measure proportional to the magnetic field. OK, now we jump forward in time almost exactly 100, 100 years to 1980. And in those intervening 100 years, two important things happened. Um, the first important thing that happened was the development of cryogenics. So you can do experiments at very low temperatures. And the second important thing that happened is that two-dimensional electron systems were developed. So you can do uh, experiments in exactly two dimensions. Um, so let's change this picture of the sample from a, from a three-dimensional sample to a two-dimensional sample this. So now it's a plane. But we're going to basically do the same experiment. We're going to measure the longitudinal voltage in the same direction as the current and the Hall voltage perpendicular to the current, V Hall, like that. Um, and I guess may maybe I should just mention, since we're, we're going to hear from Modi about the actual experiments or some of these actual experiments later on, how is it that you get your experiments to live in exactly two dimensions? Um, what you do is, OK, so this direction here we'll call the z direction out of the plane. And let's uh, draw um, the function of z, z going this way. There's some potential that the electrons feel, um, call it v of z, that looks like a particle in a box potential, like this. And the way you construct that potential is by using modern semiconductor technology. Um, in Modi samples, it's gallium aluminum arsenide, gallium arsenide, gallium aluminum arsenide. So the, so the energies of the electrons change as a function of their position. 
back in 1980 when the experiment was done by Klaus von Klitzing. It was actually a silicon sample, slightly different construction. And in the modern era, it could even be just a, a single layer of graphene where the, where the energy is lower if the electron sits on the two-dimensional graphene layer. And the energy gets very high if you try to take the electron out of the two-dimensional layer. But either way you look at it, there's some sort of particle in a box type potential or some potential well for holding the electron in a particular region of, of, of the z direction here. So you can have a, a lowest wave function in the particle in the box that looks like this, and maybe a first excited state that looks like this, and maybe some higher excited states. And there's some energy gap between the lowest uh, state, particle in a box state, and the next uh, lowest particle in a box state with some energy uh, between those two. And the idea of two-dimensional electron physics is you keep the temperature uh, of the system sufficiently low that electrons are completely trapped in the lowest particle in a box state. So wave functions will generally be written psi of x, y, z for our electron uh, wave function. They'll be written as some wave function in the z direction, which is completely frozen in this shape of the, of the lowest single particle in a box state. And then there's some wave function in the other two directions, which still have freedom. So the electrons can run around in the two dimensions freely, x and y, but their degree of freedom in the z direction is completely frozen. So that's how you get something that is strictly a two-dimensional, strictly two-dimensional physics. There's no freedom to change its wave function in the z direction. Is everyone good with that? <coughs> yes? Nod? OK, good. All right. So, um, so Klaus von Klitzing, um, in 1980, went to the high magnetic field lab in Grenoble and took his two-dimensional electron sample and cooled it down to a degree Kelvin or so and measured uh, the various voltages. And what he found, well, at low magnetic field, what he found looked an awful lot like what um, uh, Edwin Hall found 100 years earlier. He found at low magnetic field the Hall voltage, um, Vh is linear in magnetic field, and the longitudinal voltage VL is roughly constant. And then uh, things got interesting. He went up to higher magnetic field. And the uh, longitudinal voltage starts to oscillate. And then at some point, the longitudinal voltage comes down to 0. And when the longitudinal voltage comes to 0, the Hall voltage forms a plateau. It becomes completely flat. And then after some of time comes back up, this goes back up, and then maybe there will be another plateau where this comes back to zero again. Okay, this is badly drawn. This plateau is supposed to line up with the place where, where this is, is zero. This is supposed to line up with this. Okay? So, um, good. So, um, what, what do we know? These are the quantum Hall plateaus. And what do we know about these quantum Hall plateaus? Well, the first thing is that the longitudinal resistance is 0. Um, RL equals 0, meaning 0 voltage here. But we can also say that the longitudinal conductance is 0. And this seems to be um, a little bit confusing, that you have both conductance and resistance being 0 at the same time. But if you think about it for a second, it's actually not so confusing. What we actually have is that, um, let me write it over here, there's some current density, which is a 2 by 2 matrix sigma times the electric field. And what we're saying is that this, this matrix sigma is off diagonal, completely off diagonal. It's 0 on the, um, on the diagonals, and it's some constant s uh, on the off diagonal. And then if you take this, and you, and this uh, matrix and you invert it, so E is rho, with rho being equal to sigma inverse, sigma inverse times j, the resistance, uh, resistivity matrix, um, this resistivity matrix is also completely off diagonal. So the diagonal parts of both the uh, conductivity tensor and the resistivity tensor, they're both 0, um, just meaning that the current is flowing exactly perpendicular to the, to the voltage, to the electric field. OK, is everyone good with that? OK. Thank you for nodding. Good. Um, all right. So um, this actually brings me to one of uh, the first exercises that I want to assign for homework. 
And the exercise goes like this. Suppose you have a conductivity tensor of this form, where everywhere in the system, the current and voltage, oops, I just erased what we need, current equals sigma times E, um, where the current and the, and the electric field are related by this um, equation, with S being some arbitrary constant. And you have a sample in two dimensions with an arbitrary shape. You don't know what the shape is. And you put contacts on the edges of the sample like this. If you run current between two contacts, which are adjacent to each other, and you measure voltage between the other contacts, uh, show that the voltage always comes out 0 in this case. And if you cross the wires such that you're measuring a Hall voltage, so this contact goes here, and this contact now goes here. So you're running current from here to here, and measuring voltage from here to here, show that the voltage you measure is independent of the position of the contacts and the shape of the sample. Okay, So that's a, an exercise. It's written up much nicer if you go to my website. So you can try that out. Um, okay, Everyone happy with that, this, this statement? OK. Um, yell if you're not, or have any questions. OK, so what else, what else did, we, uh, did von Klitzing measure here? Um, the main thing he measured, or I pointed out, is the value of this plateau, that the voltage on this plateau is um, 1 over an integer, called the integer i, uh, h over e squared, where h is Planck's constant, e is the charge of the electron, times the current that you flow through the sample. h over e squared is now known as the von Klitzing constant, um, r von Klitzing, which is 25,000. 812 point uh, something or other, 0 0.807 dot 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 ohms. Um, it, um, it, yes, it, this is the h over e squared is now exact, is now in the new system international of, of metrology. It is h and e are both numbers that are precisely defined, that, um, that those are exact statements. So the von Klitzing constant is exactly defined. Up, you know, it's some, some number which has 14 digits, and that is exactly what h over e squared is. The statement, which is non-trivial, is that when you do this experiment, you measure exactly this number. Um, and the precision with which this experiment uh, has been done is about to 10 decimal points of, of accuracy, 10 or 11 decimal points of accuracy. Um, that's like measuring the distance from here to California uh, to less than a millimeter. Okay, so it's a rather remarkable uh, level of accuracy for an experiment where there's disorder in the experiment when you attach. If you is anyone in the room a, an experimentalist? Oh, quite quite a few. Okay, good. Um, so you know how you attach contacts to your sample? You take a big blob of solder and you whack a contact onto it. So, so you, nonetheless, you, you attached a big blob of solder to your, your sample. There's disorder in your sample. You don't know exactly where the magnetic field is. There's all sorts of effects that you might not have paid attention to. And nonetheless, the experiment is reproducible to one part in, in 10 to the 10, or maybe even better. Um, OK, so we're going to want to explain this in some amount of detail. Uh, von Klitzing won a Nobel Prize for discovery of this in, in 1985, about five years after he first uh, made this measurement. Um, one more comment about the basics of this, of this experiment here. Um, uh, that we want, might want to ask, at what magnetic field does this plateau form? So at here, we'll label this as nu equals i. This integer i is the same integer that shows up over here, and this new is known as what's new? What's new? This is what's new. New is that was a joke. Did no one get that? Oh, God, I should not. I just give up on making jokes, right? Um, is known as the filling fraction or the filling factor, um, which is well, we'll just define it this way now. It's the electron density times the flux quantum. The flux quantum is h over e. It's um, you know some Again, exactly defined fundamental qu constant. It's 4 point something 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 times 10 to the minus 15 Webers of magnetic flux divided by the magnetic field. 
And the center of this plateau is roughly um, at the filling fraction, you know, at electron densities divided by magnetic fields. These are the things you can actually change in your experiment, the electron density of the magnetic field, so, such that nu lines up with the center of the, of the plateau. Everyone's still happy? Yes? Yes, so the width of the plateau is non-universal. It depends on the particular experiment. So it's actually it's a rather surprising result that um, in very dirty samples, you have no plateau at all. In sort of medium samples, you have a, a medium plateau. In, in sort of really good samples, the plateau is still there, but it's very thin. So, it's, it's, so the width of the plateau is a complicated story, it's, and it depends a lot on the details of the sample. All right, so we're going to try to explain some of this, some of this physics in some, some amount of detail. And to begin, we will, um, I, I wish I had a bigger chalkboard here, but you know, we'll have to make do. We're going to start with the single electron problem of a single electron in a magnetic field, sometimes known as the Landau problem, um, because it was solved by Lev Landau in the early 1930s. Uh, this was before Landau was sent to jail for criticizing Stalin. Um, so just an important moral of this story is if you live in a totalitarian dictatorship, do not criticize the person in charge. Um, so Landau, Landau, Landau learned this really the, the hard way. Um, OK, so an electron in a magnetic field, the Hamiltonian uh, P plus EA, uh, squared over 2m. Um, and we're going to ignore a lot of things in, uh, to make our life simple. We're going to ignore the spin of the electron. We're going to ignore disorder. We're going to ignore spin orbit coupling. We're going to ignore phonons. Lots of things we're throwing out just to make our life simple at this point. In order to describe an electron in a magnetic field, we have to choose a gauge for our vector potential A. Um, there's many different gauges we can work with. Um, the simplest is probably so-called Landau gauge, where the vector potential is um, x times the magnetic field B in the y direction. So our plane is in the xy, the xy plane, so it has a value x times B pointing in the y direction. And this is convenient because it's translationally invariant in one direction, in, in the y direction. Um, you can check. Uh, very easily that the curl of A gives you the magnetic field B pointing in the z direction, which is what we want. And we can then plug this into our, our Hamiltonian to get our Hamiltonian is then 1 over 2m um, px squared plus um, py plus, I guess, e e b x squared, like that. Um, since the system is now translationally invariant in the y direction, we can write the wave function has to be some function of x only. Let's we'll call it chi sub, sub ky of x times a plane wave in the y direction. Again, the point of having a plane wave in the y direction is because we know that we have a Hamiltonian that's translationally invariant. In, in the y direction. So we, we now have a plane wave times some function in the x direction. Now, I want to try to make a little bit of contact with what Charlie was talking about earlier. Charlie was talking about band structures in, um, you know, in Bloch's theorem, where you have some sort of periodic potential, and you diagonalize your Hamiltonian in the presence of this uh, periodic t potential, and you have some function of the position in the unit cell times a uh, plane wave in, in both directions. You actually can translate the quantum Hall problem to exactly what Charlie was talking about. You make a unit cell with an integer number of, of flux quanta in it and work in a gauge which is periodic in that unit cell. This can be done, but it's a lot more complicated. And our life is going to be a lot easier if we do it this way. But if we did it that way, it would look a lot more like what, what Charlie was talking about. But we're not going to do that. OK. All right. So. Um, any, any questions on where we are so far? Good? OK. So py here is minus i h bar 
derivative in the y direction. And then we plug this wave function into this Hamiltonian, and we rewrite our Schrodinger equation uh, in the following form. So it then becomes uh, px squared over 2m plus I'm going to define a couple of constants here, which are sort of useful constants to know about. Um, ky l squared plus x squared this on the function k chi sub ky in the x direction equals e um, times chi sub ky in the x direction. So for each value of ky we choose, we get a different um, one-dimensional Schrodinger equation. So we re reduced our two-dimensional problem to a one-dimensional Schrodinger equation. Okay? And if you look at it a little bit harder, oh, I didn't give you what these, what these constants were. So omega c is known as the cyclotron frequency, cyclotron, um, which is just eb over m. And the other constant I defined is l, the so-called magnetic length, mag length, um, which is square root of um, h bar over eb. Okay. Um, all right, and we can look at this equation a little bit more carefully, and what we realize is that it's just a harmonic oscillator. So it's, this is the kinetic term. This is a quadratic term. It's just that x has been shifted by a constant. So it's a harmonic oscillator where the minimum of the harmonic potential is at position uh, x min is minus ky l squared. L squared, like this. Okay. So we know what the solutions of this uh, harmonic oscillator equation will be. The energy, the nth energy at, um, at given ky is h bar cyclotron frequency n plus 1 half. Okay? So we have a discrete energy, uh, set of energy levels which are independent of the momentum in the ky direction um, and depend only on this index, on this index n. So what do these eigenstates look like? Let's erase this here. Um, the eigenstates, um, let's try to draw it in, in two dimensions here. So we have uh, some system uh, with size ly in the y direction and size lx in the x direction. And the um, position in the x direction will be you know, we should think of it as being a, a harmonic well positioned around the posi uh, you know, centered around the position of here, which is the minimum of that potential well is at minus ky l squared. And so if we take the lowest harmonic oscillator state, that's a Gaussian like this, and then it propagates in this direction, it goes as uh, e to the i ky y as a plane wave in that direction, and then it's a harmonic state in this direction, and the higher, um, higher eigenstates look like not Gaussians, but, but more wiggly Gaussians, like the higher harmonic oscillator particle in a um, harmonic well state. OK, is everyone still happy with this? OK, good. Um, so our, uh, I keep having to erase what I just wrote, but I have to live with it. Um, so we, we can write our. Is it? Yeah, okay, we can write our um, density of states as a function of energy. Uh, uh, sorry, yep, so here's energy over here, energy going up, and then we have density of states like this, density of states, and then there's a big spike, a whole bunch of, of states at energy half h bar omega c. It's the lowest harmonic oscillator state, and then the next lowest harmonic oscillator state is at 3 halves h bar omega c. And at each, um, at each harmonic oscillator uh, energy level, you have a whole bunch of states corresponding to the different possible values of ky, which move the minimum of the well uh, to a different position in, in x. Okay? So these levels are known as Landau levels after I left Landau. Landau levels. Um, and it's important to try, to try to figure out how many states are there in a, a given Landau level. What's the degeneracy of one of these sets of, of eigenstates? 
So let's try to figure that out. So the degeneracy is equal to, um, well, the, the length of your system in the x direction divided by the spacing um, in x between adjacent eigenstates. Because as we change, uh, as we change ky, this moves over a little bit. Change ky some more, it moves over a little bit, and so forth. And so all we need to, to count up all the states, we just have the length in the x direction divided by the spacing. So what is the spacing? Well, as we usually have in uh, quantum mechanics, we're going to, well, in solid state, what we usually do is we take the distance in the y direction to be periodic. So the ky becomes quantized as 2 pi over ly times an integer. That's so that the plane wave going this direction has to bite its own tail when it comes back to itself. So we're really thinking about something that's a cylinder that wraps around in, in this direction. So the spacing delta x is delta ky times L squared. So because x is related to ky by a factor of L squared. So the degeneracy is then Lx over the spacing of x. Uh, delta ky is 2 pi over ly, then times L squared. I didn't mess that up. Um, and then we can simplify this to Lx times Ly over 2 pi L squared. L squared was, uh, did I get that right? No, L squared is, is, is uh, h bar over eb. Um, or was it h? Uh, problem with erasing what you just wrote is that you, one always, no, it's h bar is correct, like it is. Oh, because there's 2 pi, right, so that makes it h. Right, okay, thank you. Um, so the degeneracy is then the area of the system uh, divided by magnetic field, and then there's a, a factor, oops, area in the system times magnetic field, sorry, divided by a factor of phi naught, and phi naught is the h over E factor. And we recognize this as the area of the system times the magnetic field is the total magnetic flux penetrating through the system divided by the flux quantum. So this is flux, total flux divided by the flux quantum. Okay? That gives you the total degeneracy of each of these, of these Landau levels. So this back, brings us back, back to um, one of the things I, I defined earlier which was this thing we called filling fraction nu. And I claim that this thing, filling fraction nu, is the uh, number of Landau levels filled. Landau levels filled. And why is that? OK, so it's this number of electrons divided by the degeneracy of a Landau level, which is the number of flux, quanta. And we can rewrite that, if we want, as the density of electrons times the flux quantum divided by the flux density, which is the magnetic field. And this is how I defined the filling fraction earlier. OK? Everyone still with me? Good. All right. All right, so we've, we've made it this far. And we see immediately that there's, um, there's something interesting about this spectrum. If nu is exactly equal to an integer, then we will fill up, um, we have enough electrons to fill up exactly one of these Lando levels. And then there's a gap to making any excitations. There's, you know, the electrons are completely frozen, filling this band and leaving this band completely empty. And that is the essence of what causes our fractional quantum Hall effect. So it looks like uh, an integer, a filled band in integer with a uh, valence band and an empty, filled valence band and an empty conduction band. Now, because Modi is going to talk about edge states, I'm going to switch to talking about edge states and then back up to talking about more physics of, of integer quantum Hall effect. Um, so one thing that I left out in, in discussing a fractional quantum Hall effect is that you're, in, in reality, your sample always has edges. No matter what you do, in, unless you have an infinitely big sample or you've wrapped your sample up into a sphere or something like that, um, your sample is going to have edges. And at the edge of the sample, there's always some potential holding the electrons inside the sample. Otherwise, the electrons would spill out of the sample and land on the floor. 
or somewhere. Anyway, so there's some, so, some sort of potential that holds the electrons into the sample. And so I'll draw it like this. Um, this is the potential that holds the electrons into the sample. The bulk of the sample, the potential is flat. But then when you get to the edge, the, the potential somehow goes up to hold the electrons uh, inward. Now, um, in the middle of the sample, we're going to have Landau levels, say the lowest Landau level, like this. Next Landau level, like this. And then when you get to the edge of the sample, these Landau levels get pushed up in energy. In fact, it's not too hard to include this sort of V of x potential, so this is V of x, into our diagonalization of the single body um, uh, Schrodinger equation that we solved uh, earlier on, which just takes our harmonic oscillator equation, adds this single term to it. But roughly, the eigenstates still look like harmonic oscillator states that just if you're close to the edge, your energy is pushed up. Um, so you still have all these uh, eigenstates in these Landau levels, but the, as you get close to the edge, so these things here are x near the edge, so it's ky. You know, x is always equal to minus ky times l squared. And as ky gets close to, you know, pushes you close to the edge, the energy goes up. Okay? So now we're going to add a chemical potential, say here. And we're going to fill all the states below the chemical potential. And while the bulk of the system is gapped, you know, if you're sitting here, your lowest energy excitation is to you know, make a hole here and put an electron up there. And that's you know, very high energy if the cyclotron energy is large. In other words, if you're in a large magnetic field. So you're not going to make any of these excitations. But near the edge of the sample, there are low energy excitations. We can take, you know, we have a Fermi surface, if you want to think of it that way. We have a place where um, empty states meet, meet filled states. And this is where you can have um, low energy edge, edge excitations. And there, there's another nice way to think about um, these edge excitations or these edge modes, which make them feel you know, much more natural, I think, which is to think of, OK, here's my two-dimensional system with my edges. Okay. And on the edge, we have some sort of force holding the, the force which, incidentally, the force is always with you. And um, uh, you know, I just have to get into a, a, some Star Wars reference there. Um, and the new movie is coming out December 19th, incidentally. Um, so there's some force holding the electrons into the, into the sample. So think of it as an electric field. And there's a magnetic field, which is perpendicular to the plane of the sample. And we know, just from you know, elementary freshman physics, when you have a crossed electric and magnetic field, charged particles exhibit a drift velocity. So in this region near the edge, where there's a, uh, a slope to the potential, there's going to be a drift velocity running along the edge, and a drift velocity here running along this edge. So if I make now a little bit of a bump in the shape of the edge, add a little bit of an electric, you know, a, a, an extra electron on this edge, it's going to drift along, along the edge in, in that direction. Uh, carrying its charge with them. And this is very typical, as we heard from Charlie, this is very typical of topological insulators that there will be some sort of um, uh, edge modes. And because these are chiral edge modes, they can only move in one direction. They can't come back and move the other direction. So they're protected from uh, disorder. Now we can do, is everyone still, still happy? OK, good. So we can do a little bit better. We can actually calculate um, uh, how much current these edge modes carry. And to do that, um, we want to know something about the velocity of, of these edges. And the velocity is pretty easy to, to calculate. I think Charlie did it briefly. Um, well, OK, the group velocity is always d omega dk. Um, so remember that, that k here is really an um, um, equivalent to position. So we're asking, what's the? change in energy with position, basically. But we can write it as d energy dk if we want. So it's dE divided by h bar dk like this. And if we want to add up all of the current that's flowing this direction near the edge, we then just write the current equals the integral um, of vk dk. 
like this. Um, I guess dK always comes with a divided by 2 pi. And then if we want the charged current instead of the particle current, we add a minus E out front. And this gives us the, um, the total current flowing along the edge. Now, if we take this expression and insert the expression for V here, we get minus E integral dK. I'll pull out the 2 pi here. Um, and then we have dE dK. We can cancel the two dKs with each other and just have an integral dE. There's an h bar I missed, so 2 pi h bar. Um, there, so the 2 pi h bar becomes an e over h. So there's a minus e over h. And we're left with integral dE. And this will be the chemical potential of the edge minus the chemical potential of the bulk will be the um, total current uh, carried by the, by, the, by the edge. Now, all we have to do then is, so now we're going to do a, a simplified quantum Hall experiment here. The simplified experiment is to put one contact way down here and another contact way up here. And experimentalists will know why it is you don't do two, two contact experiments. But let's imagine an ideal two contact experiment where you, you have perfect contacts and things like that. We can put uh, one chemical potential here, call it mu right, and another uh, chemical potential up here, we'll call it mu left. This edge will get mu right. This edge going this way will have mu left. And then the total current, uh, oh boy, where am I going to put this? Put it over here, I guess. The total current will then be uh, j total running along the sample is then uh, e over h mu left minus mu right. And using um, the chemical potential is just e times v. This then gives us that uh, the two terminal, uh, g two terminal conductance between these two things is e squared over h. OK, so we rederive the uh, quantum Hall conductance in a two terminal experiment this way. OK, now um, as Charlie mentioned, and I think Modi will mention quite a bit, we can actually uh, do the same thing, but with thermal currents rather than electrical currents. Okay? And this is a homework problem, so you can go to the website and, and get hints for, for how you do this. But in the thermal experiment, what we're going to do is we're going to fix both chemical potentials to be the same, both the top and the bottom. But we're going to have different um, temperatures, T right and T left. T right here and T left. And we want to uh, calculate the uh, total thermal current that we get uh, flowing from one end to the other. Um, well, OK, let me erase this and explain how that's going to work. It's, very, it's actually very sim similar that the total thermal current, jq, it's the same integral dk over 2 pi, the velocity of each eigenstate, v sub k. And then the energy of the eigenstate, because we want to know how much energy it's carrying. So that's E sub k minus mu. And then how occupied it is, the Fermi occupation factor of beta E k minus mu. Let's use epsilon E sub k like this. And that gives us a, a formula for how much um, heat is carried by a, a quantum Hall edge. Okay. Then doing basically exactly the same manipulation here with a slightly more complicated integral because of this Fermi factor. So if those of you who are good with integrals will be able to do the integral. If you're not good with integrals, plug it into Mathematica. Or you can look on my web page. It gives you a hint of which, which integral you need to look up. And then you, you do this, and you can calculate the result that the two terminal, um, k2 terminal, um, well, that's what we're going we're to calculate. Let me define that. So the total uh, thermal current is K2 terminal, K2 terminal uh, times the difference in, in heat, in temperatures, T right minus T left. And the statement that you're asked to prove is K2 terminal divided by temperature times G2 terminal uh, is pi squared, Boltzmann's constant squared, divided by 3 e squared. Um, that's known as the Wiedemann-Franz law, which holds in a lot of uh, physical systems, but not all physical systems. Okay.
And if one is really, really aggressive, you can do what Charlie suggested, which is to try to calculate the same thing in boson language and see if you get the same result. And you should. Yes? Um, no, it's, it's independent of length. It's temperature difference only. So you're right that this is a conductance, not a conductivity. Yeah. Um, OK. So this is all I'm going to say about, oh no, there's actually one more thing I want to say about edge modes, which is, which is uh, another homework assignment. So this was one homework assignment. I'm going to get rid of this now. Um, one can look a little bit more closely at the edge modes in detail. Um, OK. Go. You can look at a little bit more closely at the edge modes in detail. So I'm going to look here, and I'm going to blow this up until it's really big. So looking like this, blowing up is really big. Here's the chemical potential, mu. And if I look really closely, I'll see there are individual k states at different values of k. Because remember, the x direction here and the k direction are really the same thing. So these are individual possible k states, these guys being filled and these guys being empty. And this is in the, in the ground state, because everything below the chemical potential is, is filled and everyone above the chemical potential is empty. And we want to look at what are the low energy excitations of this system. Well, there's one low energy excitation um, who has sort of one unit of of you know, steps in Ks. Ks are separated by some distance. There's one excitation of, of unit delta K, one excitation. Um, its energy will be uh, the velocity of the edge, the slope of the edge, times delta K, I guess times an h bar. Um, and that excitation is to take this guy who's closest to the chemical potential and push him up to here. Okay. That's the lowest energy excitation we can have at the edge. The next lowest ex excitation, call it 2 delta k, um, there are two such excitations that you can make. And their energies will be uh, 2 times the delta k, um, the total distance. With ener it, it has total momentum 2 times delta k times v times h bar. I wrote it in a different order now. Um, and these excitations can be described in the following way. One of them is to take this guy, push him two steps up to here. So now it's 2 delta k, two units of, of momentum. And it has exactly twice the energy of the last guy. Um, or there's something else I could have done, which is to push this guy to here and this guy to here. So push each of two things one unit, or I could have pushed one thing two units. Both of these have the same energy um, and the same momentum. And then we can look for excitations of three units, three units. And there's three excitations. And this gives us a series of the number of excitations um, at um, number of units. So number of excitations, we'll make a table. Um, number of units. So there's one excitation at one unit, two excitations at two units, three excitations at three units. There's five excitations at four units, and seven excitations at five units, and so forth and so on. And the, the, ex the exercise, which you're supposed to do for homework, and again, look up the homework assignment to give you a hint, um, is to show that this series is a series that describes the number of partitions of the integer over here. So let, to give you a hint here. So the partitions of four, we can write out the partitions of four in the following way. So 4 can be written as 4, it can be written as 3 plus 1, it can be written as 2 plus 2, it can be written as 2 plus 1 plus 1, or it can be written as 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. OK? And actually, to sort of give away the secret of, of why it, the, these things are, are the same, if I want to have four steps, one thing I could do is I could take one guy, push him four steps, or I could take one guy, push him three steps, and another guy, push him one step, and so forth. Okay, and that's why we're looking at um, partitions of integers. Okay, now um, I was going to save this for um, for later in the afternoon, but maybe maybe I'll do it now because it's um, oh my gosh, I only have 15 minutes left. Ah, okay, 
Well, all right. This is gonna, let, me, let me do it now anyway, because Charlie was talking about this earlier, and Modi will probably want me to do it, so I'll do it anyway. Um, we'd like to, um, Charlie um, promised us that we can write a Hamiltonian for bosons in the following way, k greater than 0, v times k, and then this b dagger k, b uh, k, where the b's are bosonic operators in the usual way, b k, uh, b dagger k prime equals delta k k prime. Okay, I guess he had a plus 1 half, but I'm, I'm going to throw those out, the, the zero point energy, just right like this. This is like a phonon. Um, a set of phonon excitations. And if we look at the excitations here, the ground, well, okay, in this bosonic language, we have a, a zero state that's going to be the ground state, no bosons, okay? We can look at excitations of one unit, which will be B dagger one on zero, the lowest, um, this is one unit of energy, and it gets, um, its energy is V times the minimal K, call it delta k, this, just like it was over here. Um, at two units, we could do b dagger 1, b dagger 1 on 0, or we could do b dagger 2 on 0. And these things have exactly the same energy, and they, um, they both have the same momentum as well. Two, units of moment, two steps in momentum and two units of energy. This one gets two units of energy because it's two excitations of one unit, and this one gets two units of energy because it's one excitation of two units. And you can keep going, and it's pretty easy to see that if you go up to you know, four units, there's four different ways to make excitations. You make b dagger 4, or b dagger 3, b dagger 1, or this, and so forth and so on. So this you know, sort of gives some flesh to the mapping between the boson, you know, counting, counting number of boson excitations, and counting uh, excitations of fermions on the edge. Okay. All right. Um, Let's see how far we can go here um, in trying to understand why it is that we have um, such nice quantization of, of Hall conductance. Um, so back to this picture here. And I'm going to ignore the edges now for a second. We're back to our uh, Landau levels like this. So we have our energy and density of states, like this. Um, and at exactly nu equals 1, we filled one Landau level, and then there's an h bar omega c gap to the next Landau level. And um, if we had exactly one filled Landau level, we have a really good insulator, because there's a gap to the next excitation. Now, in materials, the kind of thing that many of you think about it's not unnatural to have exactly one electron per unit cell. That sometimes happens. However, in quantum Hall effect, that's really very fine-tuned. Because if you change the magnetic field just a little bit, it changes the degeneracy of a Landau level. And you'll add either extra uh, electrons or extra holes. And you have to tune the magnetic field extremely precisely to land right here. So only at one exact magnetic field do you have nu exactly equal to 1. You know, so you have really an insulator only at one precise magnetic field. And if you go to a slightly lower magnetic field, you start filling uh, the next Landa level. A slightly higher magnetic field, you start putting holes in the lower Landa level. So generically, in fact, this thing isn't an insulator at all. Once you have electrons up here or holes down here, you have low energy excitations and things can move around. And then you have a problem. So, We'd, we need some, some way to understand why is it in the experiment we see plateaus in the, um, in the Hall conductivity and we see zeros in the, um, in the longitudinal conductivity. So um, you know, previously when we were discussing this, we, we said, well, let's just set the chemical potential in between the Landau levels. But in the actual experiment, this is not what you do. What you actually do is you fix the electron density and you tune the magnetic field, and the chemical potential will jump instantly from being down here to being up here. Okay, so it's, you can't very easily tune the chemical potential in between Landau levels generically. So what's going to save us here um, and enable us to have actually quantum Hall plateaus? What's going to save us here is disorder. So we have to understand the effects of disorder. Um, 
So instead of the density of states looking like this, the density of states will now look more like this. Um, this is density of states. And each of these bands gets spread out into wider bands like this. And the reason for the spreading is that in, when you have a disordered system, some eigenstates will, ha will be in an area where there's lower potential, and some eigenstates will be in an area where there's higher potential. So some of these eigenstates get pushed down in energy, and some of the eigenstates get pushed up in energy. So instead of having a, uh, a flat you know, band where everyone has exactly the same energy, you now have a spread of, of energies. Okay. Now, further than, um, uh, than just spreading out the, the energies like this, in fact, what you also do is you localize many of the eigenstates. And particularly, the eigenstates and the band tails are certainly going to be localized. And then we can argue about how wide these localized regions are and whether you know, there's going to be some extended states in the middle, extended, and then localized on the edges. Why is this? Well, there's various ways to think about this. But if, let's think about sort of in a, a semi-classical picture where you know, there are some hills and there are some valleys in the potential, like this. And if you think about an electron living in this valley, or an eigenstate living in this valley, what does he do? Well, he's an electron living in a potential. And we know from our previous discussion that when an electron lives in a potential in a magnetic field, he travels perpendicular to the potential. So he's going to actually run around, um, around sort of in a circle, around the minimum of, the, of this valley. And similarly, um, an electron up here is going to run around in a circle around this, this maximum. So instead of being these nice straight lines that we had when we solved the problem in Landau gauge, we'll have localized states sort of stuck or trapped in these minima or trapped in these maxima. And somewhere in the middle, there will be electrons that go throughout the system sort of living at the, at the intermediate uh, energies. Okay. So now, if you put our chemical potential, or our number of electrons, somewhere within the localized band, we can then change the number of electrons a little bit, or change the magnetic field a little bit, as in the chemical potential stays in the, the localized states. And that's not going to change the conduction properties at all, because you're just adding electrons into localized states. And the localized states don't participate in any of the conductivity. They just sit there. That's what it means to be localized. So, by the, the point here is that by adding disorder to the system and putting your chemical potential in the localized states, you've managed to sort of preserve the properties of, uh, of these extended states for sort of a, a longer region of changing the chemical potential or the density uh, of electrons. And at least within a range of uh, filling fractions, you'll have the same conductivity properties. OK? Does that make sense? Everyone good with that? OK. Um, so we still need a reason why the uh, conductivity is quantized so precisely to one part in, in 10 to the 10s. We need a sort of a strong principle. And the strong principle, I mean, so Charlie already gave the, um, you know, the rough Lofton argument. But the strong principle that we need to mention is that it's really what protects the uh, integer quantum Hall conductivity is actually gauge invariance. And um, this was something that was you know, realized by, by Bob Laughlin shortly after the discovery of the integer quantum Hall effect, that if you need something to be quantized extremely precisely, there has to be something extremely strong, which is, um, uh, which is preserving it. And the key theorem which Laughlin used is known as the Byers-Yang theorem. Byers-Yang, which I believe was from 1961. And it's a bit of an extension of the Aharonov-Bohm effect, which you might be familiar with. So Yang is CN Yang, the guy the Nobel Prize for parity breaking in weak interactions. Byers is Nina Byers, who was actually, she was a member of my college at Oxford um, for a long time, but eventually ended up in the early 70s in, in UCLA, where she spent the rest of her career as a nuclear physicist. Although she did, she passed away just a couple years ago. But she told me personally that she always thought it was a huge mistake to have left Oxford because she loved it so much. Um, but anyway, she was at UCLA. Um, uh, anyway, um, so the statement of, of the theorem is basically is the following. If you take any uh, physical system, I'll draw it as two-dimensional, but it could be a three-dimensional system. You cut a hole in the middle of the system. And there could be magnetic fields in the, in the system 
would, doesn't matter. You can have you know, any interactions or spin orbit or whatever you want. Doesn't matter. We're going to take this system, cut a hole in the middle of it, and we're going to add a flux quantum through the middle. We're going to add some flux through the middle. The statement is the following. If you take the flux and you, and you add to that, you change that flux by exactly one flux quantum. This flux quantum, remember, was h over e. You add that much flux through the middle, then the eigenspectrum is completely unchanged. Eigenspectrum unchanged. In other words, all the eigenstates and the, and the eigenfunctions are unchanged to a gauge transform. OK? And it's actually it's very similar to the aharonov bohm effect. If you remember the aharonov bohm effect, it's basically you do some sort of interference around a flux, some, some amount of flux. And you can see that the flux is there as long as the flux is not an integer number of flux quanta where you can't see it anymore. And this is sort of an upgrade of that statement which says not only can you not see the flux if it's an integer number of flux quanta in the middle, in fact, the entire eigenspectrum is completely unchanged. Okay? So um, since I'm down to two minutes, uh, I'll, I'll uh, uh, not give the proof of this theorem, I'll just state it. But then once we have this theorem, we can then do the Laughlin pumping argument. So Charlie did it on a cylinder. I'm going to do it on this annulus here. So I'm going to think of this as a two-dimensional system. There's a uniform magnetic field, which I'm not going to change. I'm going to leave that fixed. The flux through the middle, I'm going to have be a function of time. I'm going to change it adiabatically. And I'm going to measure current flowing from the inside to the outside of the, of the, the disk. OK? So we're going to start the system in, um, in the ground state. And then we're going to slowly adiabatically change phi of t. And it's going to stay in the ground state the entire way through the, through, the, through the process. By keeping the chemical potential in one of these localized bands, we know that there will be no longitudinal conductivity. There's going to be no dissipation of energy. No one's allowed to carry uh, current in the direction uh, that will dissipate energy. So nothing is allowed to move current in the longitudinal direction. But as we change phi, we know that there will be an EMF. EMF is minus d phi dt by Faraday. dt, that's just integral of e dot dl around the loop. So that will be going in this direction. And then if there is a Hall conduction, it will, so this is e going this way. If there's a Hall conduction, it will make a current from the inside to the outside. So J Hall is going to be. Uh, whatever the Hall conduction is times the EMF from the inside to the outside times EMF. And then we will um, just calculate the total charge that's moved from the inside to the outside. It's integral dt j Hall of t. j Hall of t is, so this is g Hall times integral dt EMF of t. The EMF is d phi dt, so this is now gh, um, I guess with a minus sign, integral d phi dt dt. So this is now minus gh um, times delta phi, um, which we will set equal to one flux quantum. So we're charging up that flux until it's exactly one flux quantum, phi naught, which is h over e. Okay. So the amount of charge is given by the uh, Hall conduction times the flux quantum. H over E is moved from the inside to the outside. Now the point is that we start in the ground state of the system. We adiabatically change until we get add exactly one flux. What we're guaranteed by the Byers and Yang theorem is that after adding one flux, you're back to exactly the same ground state. The only thing you possibly could have done in going from the ground state back to exactly the same ground state is you could have, cha you could have moved an integer number of electrons from the inside to the outside. The only thing that could possibly have happened from one reservoir to the other. So we'll set this now to an integer number of electrons. And then when we solve um, this equal to this, we get gh is um, uh, e squared over h times p, where p is an integer. Okay? So the only thing we used is um, the fact that there that we put the chemical potential in a localized state so there can be no current 
um, except Hall current. In other words, there can be no current that dissipates energy. There's no low energy excitations the whole way through the process. And we used gauge invariance that you start in the ground state, you stay in the ground state the whole way, and after you add one quantity, one quantum of flux, you have to get back to exactly the same ground state. And so the only thing that could have happened is that an integer number of electrons is moved from the inside to the outside. So in some sense, the quantized Hall conduction is doing some sort of spectroscopy on the charge of the electron. You're measuring the charge of the electron. You're counting electrons moved from one end to the other. And this gives you the, um, you know, the strength of the, uh, the integer quantum Hall effect and why it is that um, it doesn't matter if you add inter interactions between your electrons. It doesn't matter if you add spin orbit coupling. It doesn't add matter if you add phonons. Almost nothing you can think of could possibly matter because all we used is that you have localized electrons at, at the chemical potential and you have gauge invariance and that's it. Okay. I think um, I've already overrun. Have I overrun? I've overrun. Yeah. Okay. But I'll, um, I'll, I'll start. And if there are any questions, please ask them now or over lunch or and then I'll start again after lunch. No questions? Yes, one question. Um, so, so I don't have lecture notes. I only have homework problems on my website. Um, but if you want, I actually do have, uh, I, have a I have a book that I'm working on that's, uh, that you can also, also download from my website, which has a lot of this material on it as well. So it starts. Chap I mean, it starts with all sorts of topological nonsense, but if you just skip ahead to chapter like 15 or something, it starts with integer quantum Hall effect there. So you can ignore the first 14 chapters, you'll be fine. Yeah, it's 14? Chapter 14, okay, thank you, yeah, okay.